Well, hello. Welcome to Jamie TV. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for joining me so that I don't have to talk to myself like I do most of the time. If you're watching from the future, then welcome from the past. And if you're watching live right now, if you're in the chat, if you're alive, if you're, <laughs> if you're watching right now, please throw something into the chat so that you can assure me that A, the YouTube chat is actually working today and um, and so that I can say hello. Oh, I see we've got um, oh DJ Cthul, thank you very much. We have a we have a, a super chat already. Thank you very much for that because it is Friday night and I should in fact be out working, but um, I'm no gig tonight, sadly. So so thanks very much for that. That will help very much. Hi, Gerald. I know Gerald's been looking forward to this stream. So I'm um, glad you could make it, mate. And hi, Samuel. Dude, prepare to be scared. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Oh, and hi, Matt. Thanks for being here. And oh, David's here. David, I have to tell you something. I sent you an email because I thought... The other day, I thought, it's about it's about a week ago, I think. I thought, I've not heard from David for a while. I wonder how he's doing. I'll send him a message just to, you know, check up on him. And uh, I sent you a really nice message. I promise it was lovely. And, um, and I didn't hear back from you. So I checked my sent emails the other day. And actually, I'd sent one to you, one to IK Multimedia, and one to uh, John Hornby Skews, who I have a few endorsement deals with, and uh, none of them were in my sent box, so something had gone wrong. So I sent you a lovely email, um, but it didn't send, so <laughs> I'll send you one again, I promise. Ham Hammer, welcome to the chat. I don't think I've seen you in one of my streams before, so welcome. And hi, Grant. I uh, hope that everything's going all right since your operation, and I believe you've had your pot off. So, hope everything's uh, everything's cool, dude. Right, so, we are gathered here today to talk about scary music. Now, Brad to you. Ah, <laughs> all right, Brad, dude. <laughs> um, yes, right, so, what am I on about? We are gathered here today to talk about scary music. And um, this is a thing that every year, when it gets to this time of year and we're approaching Halloween, um, I, I always think I would love to make a scary track, right, for this time of year. But it's always kind of too late when I when I think of it. And, I'm, and so I end up not doing it because I think by the time I finish it, it's going to be like, you know, people have will be past this period and people will be thinking about Christmas. So, and the, you know, that would that would really suck. So I never end up doing it. Well, this year I've been thinking about it since September finished. So I've put quite some thought into this. I've, I did my research. I um, put it out to um, social media. I started in quite a few different groups and things. What makes music scary? I wanted to get ideas from people like to you what makes a piece of music scary because you know I'd made some notes about my thoughts and how it all works but I thought it'd be great to hear from people because maybe there's something I haven't thought of now of course typical oh Matthias is here hi dude Typical. Oh, and, and I've got a message from you, Matthias, and you want me to listen to your track, and I've been incredibly busy today, but it's on my list. It's in the Darth Vader book, so it's going to get done. Um, as soon as I finish this stream, I'm going to check out your track, and I will get back to you, I promise. Um, okay, so what was I saying? Now I've completely lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, yeah, right. So I, I've made some notes, and I thought, you know, but maybe somebody out there has got some ideas, some things I've not thought of. Uh, but yeah, um, oh, that's where I was, right? Yeah, so, so as usual, on social media, you know, people don't read things right, do they? You know, um, so I asked, in your opinion, what makes music scary? And what I got was links to scary tracks, which is all right, fine, but not, you know, not really what I asked for. And also, I got some people 
taking it as an opportunity to educate me, right? <laughs> like as if I was saying, can somebody please tell me <laughs> how do we make scary music? Um, so actually, you know, that was cool because some people came up with some ideas of chord changes and stuff, and that's interesting. Um, but it seemed to me that there were quite a few people who actually couldn't say what makes a piece of music scary. Although I did get quite a lot of good answers, there were quite a few people who would tell me what their feelings were when they heard a piece of music, but didn't seem to be able to tell me what it was about it that made it scary. So we're going to examine that today. Also, there was one person who said that uh, they didn't believe that music alone could be scary. Um, that it's only really scary when it accompanies a scary movie. Well, I disagree with that. And I'm going to tell you why. I did a thing, right? So, uh, last Friday, I was on my way to my gig. And I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my homework. So, I'm going to listen to some scary tunes on my way to my jig. To my, what's a jig? <laughs> on my way to my jig, right? <laughs> so, God. Um, so, what I did was... I found a playlist on YouTube Music of themes from horror movies. And I listened to it on the way. And I really, really enjoyed listening to all these tunes. And I, and I was picking out what I think it is about them that makes them frightening. And, uh, and then I went and did my gig. And then when I got in the car to come home from my gig, I thought, I'm going to put that playlist on again. Right? So I listened to it all the way home. Hey, princess, thanks for joining us. Um, so I listened to these scary tunes on my way home from my gig. And when I got back to the village where I live, it's the middle of the night. There's nobody about. I pull down the lane, the lonely, dark lane that leads to the back of our property and reverse onto the drive. And as soon as I get out of the car and the headlights go off, it's pitch black. It's always the same when I get on from a gig. For some reason, the lights in the back of my car don't, don't work when I'm unloading. There's no light in the back of the car to help me out. I don't know why. Anyway, so it's pitch black. And as always, right, I unload my car in the dark and I put my gear away in my storage place, which has no light in it. I've done it a million times. I could do it with my eyes closed. and might as well have my eyes closed because it's pitch black. And, and I always just do this without thinking about it. I'm not a person who's scared easily. I'm not a, you know, I'm, I'm just not made that way. Because it's, oh, sorry, I accidentally <laughs> pressed the key. Um, I'm just not made that way. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, a nervous person. But this particular night, when I got out of the car, I was like, what was that noise? I'm like looking over my shoulder and I'm a bit spooked. I've got to be honest, I was a bit like, did I just see something out of the corner of my eye? Right? And it dawned on me, you know, it's, I've been listening to this terrifying music all the way home and it had spooked me. So what I had to do, I had to come in here and have a word with myself. <laughs> I came in here, and I didn't put my lights on or anything. I just came in here, and I had a word of myself and sorted myself out. And then I went out and unloaded the car as normal. But I, I think that, you know, music that um, is meant to be scary, that's done really, really well, can be actually frightening. It certainly spooked me that night anyway. Now, I've made some notes and I'm going to keep referring to my notes because I've got a lot to get through. I don't want to miss anything. I've got some cool stuff to show you. So let's have a, just a, a bit of a look over here. I'm, my iPad that I normally use as a, a stream deck is, uh, that's got my notes on this evening, right? So um, if I go to a side view, I can probably show you. That um, so that's just out of shot over here. You can see the the white of um, P 
pages is the app I'm using for my notes and over here you can see my current phone my uh, 14 plus is that's my stream deck now I didn't know you could actually get the OBS uh, blade app for the phone so if I keep if I keep doing this which you can't see because I'm on the wrong view <laughs> uh, yeah so if I keep doing this it's because my arms aren't very long and my phone's a bit too far away I should have thought that one through a bit better but anyway right so now what I'm going to do is divide this into two sections right so there are sounds that lend themselves to scary music and then there are musical devices, as in theory, and what we do with note traces and chords that make the music sound creepy. So we're going to have two distinctly different sections. And I'm going to start with the simple one. The easiest one is the sounds that lend themselves nicely to scary music. And when I asked social media, um, you know, when I asked people what they thought made music scary there were lots of answers in this department less so when it comes to the theory side of things so and some of these things i would not thought of so let's have a look at my list and what i'm going to do if i can press the right button here i go stretching right um that's beat hook by the way uh, which i used because i i normally i like to have a piece of music for my introduction when i start a stream but i didn't have that today because of the kind of stream that i'm doing so just to kind of get started, I just played a few um, a few chords with the choir in Beat Hawk because I really want people to hear this. If you don't have Beat Hawk or if you don't have the choir in app purchase, it is excellent. That was um, the children's choir number two, I think, and um, and I just think it's spectacular. I haven't found a choir on iOS that I like better. So, uh, so that's what that was. Anyway, right, so if I just come out of here, and you will see that in Logic Pro for iPad, I've got some, I've got, there's nothing recorded in this project at all, but I've got some instruments set up already. And uh, these are to represent some of the instruments that people named when they were talking about what they think makes music scary. Right, now, one thing that nobody said at all was piano and i suppose that's because piano is probably the most versatile instrument of all it is and i'm terrible at it uh, but it's like it's like one instrument to rule them all piano works in almost any musical situation it has uh, one of the biggest um, ranges of octaves of notes uh, of any instrument and it's possibly the most expressive. It's just a wonderful instrument that I'm really terrible at. But I'm going to demonstrate most things today with piano because my, my thinking on that is I'm going to be using an, an overhead view so you can see what notes I'm playing. Uh, so you can see my tiny little, little girl-sized fingers as I play these notes. So that if you want to refer to the video later and you want to copy anything I'm doing, if you want to, um, if you want to, you know, like pause it and see what my fingers are doing, you'll be able to do that. Um, and also, because I'm such a terrible piano player, if I can make something sound, if I, if I can evoke a certain emotion with my terrible playing, then I must be, I must be right. Okay, I must be I must be right about what theory makes something scary. Uh, let's just have a quick catch up with the chat. Princess is a scaredy cat. <laughs> You'd have been terrified, would you? <laughs> um, Joanne Joanne, I've just done a whole album dedicated to October and Halloween. Is that right, Gerald? I know you're a big Duran Duran fan. Um, I'm a particularly big fan of of the bass player. He, and I really, really admire the bass player because not only is he an excellent player, he's also really, really good at the kind of bass playing that I'm not so good at. So although I'm not a huge fan of the band, I really do like listening to listening to them to listen to the bass, how it works with the drums and, you know, um, yeah, I really, really do dig his playing. 
Um, DJ Cthulhu says, we we evolved to avoid predators, rustling, silly noises. Just saying, environmental awareness is a survival trait. Yes, it's very, very true, you know. It's, it is it is natural, I suppose, um, to be a scaredy cat like Princess. <laughs> um, Mateus says, detune p- piano is spooky AF. Yes, uh, and um, we might have a look at that in a bit. Speaking of which, um, what I may do, if this stream goes well, and if people like it, and people are into this, then what I may do is continue to stream um, over the next week or two, and actually progress a piece through those streams and make an actual fully-fledged, finished, sort of, you know, horror movie soundtrack type piece, right? If you think this is shit, just tell me you think it's shit, you know, and, I won't, and I'll stop it, I promise. You won't upset me. Um, and uh, Princess also says, what do you like more, Cubasis 3 or Logic Pro? Uh, neither. I like both. Oh, I have some news. I have some news. Um, I really, really like both. Cubasis 3 is, for me, more natural because I, I'm, I'm a Cubase fanboy i've always used cubase i've used everything else as well along the way but cubase was the first door that i used and um i still have it on my desktop and um so to me i'm very very familiar with the way that cubase's 3 works so it's kind of my favorite but logic pro appeared out of nowhere and introduced a lot of features that we'd been asking for for many years in cubase's 3 and never got so i'm using Q- uh, logic pro more than Cubasis 3 at the moment because I've missed out on those features on iOS for such a long time and I'm enjoying them. Really, what I want to do, I don't really have a preference. What I, what I really want to do is to take the features from both that I like and bolt them together. All right, so the news that I have. Um, Samuel, are you listening? Uh, I've spoken to Lars at Steinberg about Cubasis 3, and I asked him, is there going to be another Cubasis 3 update? Is Cubasis 3 done now? Are you just going to maintain it but not develop it any further? Um, Now, at Steinberg, they play the cards very close to the chest. He's not going to tell me too much, and I'm telling you everything I know. Cubasis 3 will get an update. I can't tell you when, because they don't know yet. They're working on a big update, and um, and when it's when it's ready, it's just the way Steinberg work. They don't work to a date. When it's ready, it will happen. All right. So there is a new update coming for Cubasis three. I can't tell you what's in it. That's it. That's the news. Okay. So um, Samuel says Mellotron strings and choirs are creepy. Yes, they are, and we'll be looking at that in a bit. Uh, regarding sounds, church bells, thunder, lightning, rain. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got that covered. Thank you very much for the super chat, David. I really, really appreciate that. You are a wonderful human being. You know, all the best people in the universe come together in my chat, <laughs> in my streams. Um, Matt says, <laughs> Brad says, my Cajon can get a bit scary. Um, <laughs> actually, Brad, uh, your Cajon um, is is well and truly missed when you are not at the acoustic jam. Um, it's you know it's it, it's not the same since you've been coming and, and bringing the kahan. It's just not the same when you're not there. Okay, right. So piano through noises. Give it some high bark low f- <laughs> low fi. Yeah. Lo-fi is something we are definitely going to be looking at. Uh, DJ says, you were, talk- you were talking to Steinberg at Synthfest. There's defo a big update in the works. Yes. Um, and that's all we know for now, unless there's anything that you know that I don't know, which is entirely possible. Um, okay, so we should, we should crack on. So um, you can see Logic Pro there. Uh, now, for my piano sound, which is not one of the instruments that was named, 
as a scary instrument. Have I got a view where you can see my hands? Yes, you have. Yes, I have. Okay. I just want to show you this real quick. Uh, this is Piano Tech 8. This is the um, Steinway D Cinematic preset, which I really, really like. Maybe I should turn that up a little. It's my volume like. Okay. Okay. Oh, hi, Maria. Thanks for joining us. Hope that you are uh, extremely well today and that um, that you've not, well, apparently you've not drowned because you're here, right? Um, but uh, for anyone who doesn't know, right, because you're spread all over the world, you lot, um, in the UK today, it's absolutely banging it down. It has been for the last couple of days. And we've got floods and stuff uh, all over. I'm very fortunate because my missus's work told her to leave early and then both kids schools um closed early so i was able to get everyone home and just make sure that everyone was safe so anyway right so so that's my piano sound right i'm using piano tech eight now the list that uh the list of things that people said were scary the first one on my list is church bells now i don't have an app on my iPad, I've got something on the desktop actually, but on my iPad, I don't have anything with an actual church bell kind of a sound. But I do have uh, in Logic Pro for iPad here, this is just um, an alchemy sound. Right, uh, just that alone. Uh, it's called Distant Ethereal Bells. Just that alone. Yeah, that could be spooky. You could see how that could be. In fact, do I have this mapped to... Uh, I think I have my tempo pad mapped to this drone here. Oh, I do. I do. All right, let's have a drone and some bells. Okay, my bells are not working now because I need to do that. Why did my drone stop? I thought that sound sustained. Apparently it doesn't sustain forever. Oh well, never mind. Okay, right? So, I mean, even that, just that, that could be the beginning to a really scary track add some you know sound effects like some wind and rain and thunder and we're on his way uh maria says it took my mom six hours to get to skegness though lucky set off before got really bad yep the bell sound a little bit like oh metallic yeah <laughs> um okay so before I lose the plot completely, let me refer to my notes. Right, so we've got church bells. Also, church organ. I wanted to use BX3. Or is it B3X? I can never remember which way around it is. B3X, I think it is. You know, the Hammond by um, IK Multimedia doesn't work well in Logic Pro for iPad. It keeps crashing. In fact, a lot of the time it won't even open at all. So I'm using Galileo instead. Ah, there we are. Okay. Right, now let's go like, uh, let's go down here. Right, now if I play, uh, let's play, yeah. We've got a diminished chord. And let's just move through the inversions. Uh, which, you will see what a terrible keyboard player I am. by Just by the way that I finger these chords, right? Uh... made it right but yeah you can see how that could be really spooky now lots of things associated with religion seem to be listed as um appropriate for scary music we've got um children's choir 
and that's just the sound that I used for the beginning of the stream. Why is it, I wonder, that things to do with children's voices are spookier than, you know, like say if it was a mixed choir or a male voice choir? Why is that? I mean, it is, but why? I don't really quite get that. The way that um, I've heard in some horror movies, the soundtracks have like the sound of children playing in the distance, right? Why is the sound of children playing spooky? Who knows? But it's a fact, right? Now, um, what we got here, we've got... Uh, Church bells, church organ, children's choir, religious music, which I don't have a way of demoing that particularly, but um, yeah, religious music. Um, very often, uh, religious, like um, like church choirs are used in, in horror music. Toy piano. Now, this is another weird one. Why would a toy piano be spooky? <laughs> this, but this sound, by the way, is just, um, this is from... The sampler in Logic Pro. Could have been a bit louder, I think. And yet, you know, again, it's a thing. It is. It does lend itself to spooky music. I really could not tell you why. A lot of people said theremin. Now... A theremin uh, is not an instrument that I have. Um, you know, like on my on my iPad, I don't have an app. I do have an app. Let me start that again. I do have an app on my iPad that makes a theremin sound, but it's not a UV3, so I can't use it in Logic Pro for iPad. However, for anyone who's not sure what a theremin is I have it here that made an interesting sound and um, let me just pull the vo oh actually I don't think that volume is not going to work because I'm plugged into an interface so I'll just be careful with the volume here right okay so here's a theremin sound and um, in this theremin we can Let's add a bit of reverb here. What's that classic? Um, uh, what is the, is it? Um, what was that program called? Is it One Step Beyond with the theremin in the in the soundtrack? Wish I could play it. It only just came to mind. So a bit more reverb on that. And the other thing you can do with this is you can actually change the waveform. Which sounds horrendous, but you can do it. And maybe horrendous might just be what we're looking for. Okay, so <laughs> that's probably enough of that. It has a delay too. Anyway, as um, as a theremin sound. Okay, so um, heartbeat and pulsing sounds. If you um, wanted to maybe emulate a heartbeat in your track, you might say, for instance, you might take a kick drum sound, and then you might say EQ all the top of it, make it a really sort of a, a woolly sound, and then make it kind of um, like a pulse in the background you could even do something like because it because when you do that it makes it like um like like you're in the music um you know like you're feeling what's going on around you almost like if it's a horror movie soundtrack like you're in the movie and and if you make say that heartbeat sound speed up you know, like we're getting more and more frightened. We're getting closer and closer to whatever, you know, where the, the monster appears or whatever. And you can create the same effect with pulsing sounds. You could do it with a low bass sound. 
all sorts of methods. And then on my list, I've got things like sound effects, like screams, howls, moans, chains, clanking. That's from me, actually. That was mine. And breathing sounds, screechy sounds, rough or harsh sounds, challenging sounds. Um, all, you know, basically the timbre of a sound. Right, so, uh, in here, what have I got? I've got mini bit. Now, mini bit might not be the best example for this, but I just got it and I wanted to have a play with it, right? So, it's perfectly good reason, I think. Mini bit is a synth that emulates the kind of sounds that you would find in, like, 80s games machines, 80s computer games, that sort of thing. And I haven't got it turned up loud enough. Now, you might think this is silly because you would probably naturally assume a synth like this, you would probably use it for like maybe, you know, some chip, to, chip tune kind of a, a um, instrumental piece for a game or something like that, you know? But... I would say there are some sounds in here that will lend themselves really, really well to a horror soundtrack because, because of the time that these sounds are from, they're a bit harsh around the edges, they're a bit abrasive. And if we have a little look in here, that's not one of the sounds that I wanted. Right, there are some sound effects. There are some really, really cool sequences. things like this if you watched my streams where I was making a, a cyber metal track and I added a few little sounds in there towards the end of uh, the production which I called ear candy it sounds like this might be sort of the equivalent of ear candy for a horror movie That sort of thing, right? Uh, I also opened up Sampletron. The Sampletron, this kind of, there was, when this came out for iOS, there was kind of a lot of, there was kind of a, a lot of debate about this. Some people thought it was a lot of money, which it isn't for what it is, but it's more expensive than most people are used to paying for apps, I guess. Um, however, it's, utterly excellent. There are some sounds in here that I think would really, really be good for um, for like a horror soundtrack. And um, the reason I'm talking about this now is because in the list of effects and timbres that people came up with, rough and harsh was something that people kept mentioning because rough and harsh sounds are going to make you feel a little less comfortable. So anything that's kind of lo-fi is really going to be helpful. Um, now in Sampletron we've got these kinds of sounds. Hey Ed, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here. Let's have a listen to a few of these sounds in Sampletron because there's some really, really awesome stuff in here.
Here we go. A choir. One of the reasons I like using sounds like this is because if we're using some software that's supposed to emulate strings uh, or a choir or something like that, and it's supposed to sound real, then you've always got that feeling like, have I made it sound real enough? You know, like, because it's not just down to the samples, it's the way you humanize it, the way you do the articulations. Have I made it sound realistic enough? Now, if you use some sounds that have come from a Mellotron or something like that, then it's not going to sound, it's going to be obvious that it's not supposed to sound like the real thing. And I think that's nice. <laughs> Not having to panic. You know, you could blame it on the app instead. Right, so that... I mean, there's some wonderful, wonderful sounds in there, and and the thing about a sample tron is, you know, like in a lot of in a lot of synths, in a lot of emulation apps, what I find myself doing is using the sound, but switching off all the effects if it has any, switch them all off, and and use some better ones, all right? But the effects in this are absolutely superb. These are off the charts. Sampletron, if it's one of those apps that you've looked at and you thought, should I, you know, shouldn't I? It's a lot of money, you know. Um, if you like those old school sounds, if you like that old uh, lo-fi thing, because it's not for everyone, then I'm telling you it's excellent. So take the plunge. Right. Now, where am I? Look at your look at your notes, hippie, and don't lose the plot. Because, you know, there's a first time for everything. Um, okay, right, so, so those are some of the sounds that lend themselves nicely to horror music. I mean, I'm sure I haven't covered them all, but, you know, gives you a good idea. Now, what I'm going to try and do now is give you a good idea of some of the things that we can do musically, as in, like, music theory or throwing music theory out of the window in order to make awesome horror music. It's it's kind of, how can I put this? There are people who don't want to know music theory. There are people who presume that it's going to be really, really tough and hard work to learn, which if you get a good teacher, it's not. It's actually as easy as putting on a hat. It's so simple. I get it, you know, and I'm not a bright person. Um, it's It really is very, very straightforward, especially just learning the nuts and bolts, everyday music theory that we can use to make most music with. Um, so some of you in the chat may may be coming from that point of view. Some of you may know more about music theory than I do, right? Whatever. Wh whichever camp you're in, or if you're somewhere in between, it's all good. Because when we're making horror music, what we're doing is breaking the rules on purpose. Because you cannot make, like, scary, exciting, or interesting music by staying within the scales all the time by staying within the rules i think personally the best approach is learn music theory from a teacher who will teach it you like in a kind of a real world kind of a way and cut through all the bullshit that you find in all those dreadful dreadful music theory books and um and and will do it in such a way as you can enjoy it Right. And then you will know, 
you will know how to break the rules. Some people come from that kind of school of thinking like, well, I don't know the rules of music, so therefore I'm not hindered by anything when I play. I'm just writing a riff on my guitar because it sounds good, right? And that way I'm more likely to come up with something unique and interesting. Um, the sort of the Kurt Cobain school of thought. And you know what? There is some there is some truth in that that does actually hold some weight. But I think it's also limiting. I think the best thing to do is to learn the theory, then you know when you can break the rules. And and um and I'm gonna show you how to do that now. Stop waffling, you stupid hippie. Right. Let's go to a different view and we'll have a we'll select my piano. Turn it up a little bit. Now, as I said earlier, I am a terrible, terrible piano player. So if I can make this stuff sound the way I want it to sound, then anyone can do it. And that's why I'm doing it on the piano instead of the guitar. And also because when you're watching someone play guitar, it's much more difficult to figure out what notes they're actually playing than if you're looking at a nice overhead view of someone's hands on a controller keyboard like this. This is my iRig Keys, by the way, which is extremely old. It's done tons and tons and tons of work, this, and it still works. It's, um, it's, it's I think it's become a little less sensitive. Um, sometimes I have to hit the keys a little harder. Um, but it's been used and used and used. It's, so, you know, I very highly recommend any stuff from IK Multimedia. I've got tons of it. Okay, and the other advantage of using this view uh, of me playing a controller keyboard is that you can have a good laugh at my piano skills. And you're very welcome to laugh. I don't give a shit. Okay, so on my list of things that we can do to make music scary. Number one on my list is pitches. Now, very high pitches can be harsh. They can be difficult to listen to. A little bit cruel on the eardrum. You know, especially for an extended period of time. Right? Um, and by the same token, extremely low notes can be very, very dark and menacing. Let's just pitch down here. It would be awesome if I could do both at the same time, but I can't because I've only got three octaves here. I do have an enormous controller keyboard. You wonder what I was going to say then, didn't you? I do have an enormous controller keyboard, um, an old M Audio one, which is excellent. But if I put that on the desk, there's no room for anything else. So, so you just have to imagine what it would be like if we had those lovely low notes happening and some very high ones at the same time. <laughs> okay. Now, um, note choice. This is probably the most important po point of all. Let's just return this to factory preset position. Um, it's very difficult to write anything that is truly frightening by sticking to a basic scale. If you're relying on scalar apps, you will probably need to ditch them for this kind of composition. Some of them, you can tell them what notes you want to include, um, and so you could perhaps program a scalar app to include some out, outside notes. But the thing is, is it's about where you place them, not just which notes you use, but where you actually place them. And so I think for this kind of composition, scalar apps would probably be 
fairly useless. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And I'm always happy to be proved wrong. You're going to need some outside notes. So you're going to need to think chromatically. You know, you're going to need to keep stepping outside of the box and see what you can find that sounds challenging, uncomfortable, frightening. So an example, a really good example to get started with is um, let's let's stick to the key of C for the moment. Right. So in the key of C and bear in mind, people in the chat may have very, very limited music theory. Some of you might be music theory geniuses. I don't know who I'm talking to, and I'm probably talking to a mixture of both. So if I'm talking about something and it's a little bit beneath you, then my apologies, but just be patient and, you know, we'll get into the good stuff. So um, C major scale. All of the white keys, right? It's impossible to play anything scary just using those notes. So what we have to do is we have to think about stepping outside of the box. So here's our root note of C. The second note of the scale would be here. So instead of going there, let's go root to a minor second. Now you can already hear that's pretty challenging. That's a a scary interval. Okay, now also from the root, let's play a flat five. It, this is a note with many names. It's also known as the devil's interval. It can be called a tritone. It can be called the blues note. It's basically the note which is six semitones up from the root. Okay, now, Another way to find it is, if you think about your chord, the fifth in the chord, and it's just one semitone, semi, what's a semitone? A <laughs> semitone shy of the fifth. Okay, so two very challenging sounding intervals there. Um, now, I probably should mention that this note this interval here, the devil's interval. Um, it can be called a tritone because it's like, it's six semitones up from where you start. Let's say you start on your root, so it's here, right? Um, if it's six semitones, it's three tones, hence tritone. Is the note, it's also called the devil's note because um, there was, um, I don't know how much truth there is in it, but people say, people say that uh, once upon a time, um, people were banned by the church from using that movement in a composition. Because it's like the devil's note because it's too scary and challenging sounding. I presume that was, you know, for religious music. So, anyway, let's just go back to this view so you can see what I'm doing. Um, okay. Now, the other thing, or the next thing rather, is dissonance. A lack of harmony. Dissonance is, is, like, playing, is like playing a note... Well, okay, let's let's look at it like this. When we play a harmony note, so if I play the root of C, and then I play, if I play, uh, what key are we in? Let's, let's say that we're in C minor. Let's play a nice C minor chord to sort of set the tone, right? Right, so in C minor, if I play the root and then play my minor third, that's a pleasant harmony, that works. If somebody sings this note, and somebody sings this note, it's going to sound epic. So dissonance is the opposite of that. It's when we play a note against the root or against against the lead note, like let's say if we're thinking in terms of harmony, um, that does not sound pleasing to the ear. That would be one, of course. 
so would this. Right, uh, maybe we could have a look at... No, we'll leave it at that for a moment, because I'm going to cover that later anyway. Ignore me. I'm kind of thinking out loud. Okay, so... Pairings like this would make for an uncomfortable... It's an, an uncomfortable sound. Hence dissonance. Right, so let's try something. If I play a C minor chord with my left hand, and then with the right, I'm going to play a minor second movement. Right, and there you hear the dissonance. The lower the notes are, the more that dissonance is a thing. Just twatted my camera there. Well, it's okay because we're not using that view, thankfully. Okay. Right. Am I back on the octave I want to be on? I think so. Right. Now, over this C minor, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play, let's say, um, let's play the flat seven, minor six, and the fifth. which is, uh, let's see, B flat, A flat, G. Now that is just a miserable sounding melody. Nothing outside of the box there. All within the minor scale. Now we're gonna play it again, but we're gonna add the flat five. The F sharp. This uncomfortable kind of outside note will be considered a bad note, you know, in another context, like let's, let's say if we were, if we were writing some cheeky dance floor filler for some, you know, teeny bop band, it would just be a bad note. But in this context, it's exactly what we're looking for. Now we're going to hit that C minor again. And we're going to be playing, we're going to play the tritone that can be found within a major scale. I'll cover that in a moment. Okay, so within a major scale, we actually have a tritone that occurs naturally. Um, let me cover that properly, right? So we've got a C major scale. Right? Now, if I play this F, which is the fourth of the scale, we've got here this B. That is six semitones up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? So we have a tritone that actually appears within the major scale, which you probably would not imagine would exist, right? So let's see. How can we incorporate this in what we were doing just then? Um, okay. So we'll play the... C minor chord, and we'll play the tritone. Okay, now, if I was to play some kind of a melody and incorporate those outside notes like that. Okay, we're heading in the right direction for the kind of music that we're wanting to make. Another thing that we can do, right, is to not resolve. So if we play, in fact, well, let's stick with what we were doing just there. We've got this nice little miserable melody, right? So my C minor chord, right? There's my little tune. We'll just establish the little melody over few bars and then we'll skip and just not finish that melody you know just leave it hanging there and that leaves an air of like just discomfort it's like 
you know, it's like, what is coming next? If you did that... Let that hang, and then you go into the next the next section, you know? I don't know, just a just an idea, but I reckon that could work. Hey Leela, <laughs> nice to see you, chick. Thanks for being here. Right now, chord choice. Chord choice. If you thought that, you know, we created some spooky sounding things there with just by choosing the correct intervals, then chord choice just takes it to a whole other level. In fact, for me, for me, chords are really where music is at. You know, when, you, when you're creating music, you can start anyway. You can start with drums. You can start with a melody. You can start, you could be inspired just by a snare hit and then you know you hit it again and you hit it again and and you start to build things around it and it doesn't matter where you start as long as you're happy with it when you finish but for me what's always right at the core of composition is the chords it really boils down to that and kind of legally as well i believe what music boils down to um, the nuts and bolts of it is is the chords. So, let's have a look what we can do with chords to make things scary. Rise of Dark Leela, the diminished. Well, yes, I haven't actually covered diminished chords as such yet, but I have been using the note that we use to make the diminished, um, which is, of course, the flat five or devil's note, or tritone, or, you know, whatever you wish to call it. Um, I, for a long time, I just knew it as the blue note because of the kind of music that I you know, played when I was learning. Okay, so let's just go back to this view here so you can see what I'm doing now. Chord choice. Let's start off simply by playing three minor chords that are in a key together. So I'm going to go, I'm just going to go C minor and G minor, F minor. Now all we have there is just a miserable sound. <laughs> my, you know when I said that my Irig keys is, is getting a little bit, the sensitivity is starting to go, I think because it's had so much hammer. Well, I think that was an example right there. Wasn't my shoddy playing honest. Okay, so there we've just simply got a miserable sound. Now let's lose the G minor and use an E minor instead. It's an outside chord, and we want to make the end of this descending sequence really, really dark. So let's go like, say, uh, C minor, F minor, to an E minor. Right? So, you know, something happened now. Let's do that again. Okay. And now we've we've stepped outside of the key. We've used a um we've used a chord that's like, you know, outside the realms of, of the scale that we appear to be in. And we've made a movement there that that sounds, to me, a bit menacing. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for. Let's try a different one in a, a different key because I seem to be, I seem I keep hitting C minor, F minor. You know, I, I really enjoy those chords. So let's try something in a different key though. So we'll go like um, F sharp minor, uh, E flat minor, and C minor. <laughs> there I go using it again. Right, and you just using a chord in there that's out that shouldn't be in there. It's outside the box. Right, so this is what you need to do. You need to, you need to. Oh, Simtex, get out of here, dude! Thanks for joining us. 
uh, yeah, so you need to make yourself, if this is the kind of thing you want to do, if you want to make something sound scary, then you've got to make yourself step outside of the comfort zone and go outside the box. And a lot of this might involve, you know, it might involve sort of uh, a certain amount of playing things and experimenting and making a lot of really horrible sounds, you know, but you, but you will hit on something that sounds awesome sooner or later. Hey, Jade. <laughs> nice to see you in the chat, Jade. Hope you are very, very well. Uh, why are you awake? At, well, quiet. Yes. Why are you awake at five a.m.? You must be insane. Go back to sleep. Um, because you know, there's just a stupid hippie here playing uh, scary chords. Okay. Now, where was I? Let me look at my notes and just uh, get back with the program. All right. So, using unrelated chords tastefully, for want of a better word can give us this uncomfortable feeling and of course it doesn't have to be just three chords uh, let's try something a little bit more um, so let's see now now I'm you know I'm making this up on the spot it could be quite dreadful um, I'm gonna go off mine Yeah. <laughs> Somebody stole a chord from my keyboard. All right, I'm going to do that again and see if I can do it any less pants. Right, now that, right there, that's a bloody miserable um unpleasant sequence of chords which could be exactly what we want and when i reached that d minor there it sounded like it, oh, it really needed to go somewhere else it needed to resolve somewhere so for this kind of music what i would do is not let it hang let it stay there being uncomfortable what i've done there is i've used um let's see f g e E flat D minor. I've used five different minor chords there. Um, now, in in any one key, you're only going to get three of them. So we've got two chords at least that are outside of the scale. So that takes us to a place where we don't really know what scale we're in, and that's fine. That's fine because you don't have to. You don't have to be able to play a melody over the top of it in one key. You construct your melody over the top, uh, chord by chord. And that's how we do it. Okay, so there are some chords that convey these kinds of emotions all by themselves. So, in other words, just a chord that in itself sounds scary. So, let's have a look at a, a couple of those. Now, there are a lot of these. I'm just going to cover a few good examples, you know, because you don't want to be here all day, right? Um, so let's see, we'll go to E minor now, we'll just freshen things up by changing key. I'm going to play an E minor with a flat 6. So this will be my E minor. Right, so there's just E, G, B. Now to make this to a, a E minor with a flat 6, we're just going to add a C. Or if I play it all at once. Right, kind of a. I don't, I don't even know what I don't even know what emotion I'd associate with that chord, but it's not a comfortable chord. Right now, let's try a couple more based around E minor, E minor, uh, add nine. We'll say okay. So, is my E minor. So that's E G B again, and let's add an F sharp. That would be my nine, I believe. I think I'm right there. Okay, now if I brought that nine down an octave, that would make it a second. And there we have quite a dissonant sounding chord. Let's just bob that down an octave. Okay. All right. 
So that's what I was talking about with dissonance, but now it's included in a chord. More uncomfortable chords might get me out of bed. <laughs> Are you watching me in bed, Leela? What time is it there? Um, okay. So, um, E minor, major 7. So, an E minor, major 7 is an E minor with the natural 7 from the E major scale. Right? Check that one out. That's like, that's probably like the, the ultimate horror movie chord. And then uh, we'll do, let's do one more. We'll go with an um, E augmented major seven. Now the E augmented, this will be, uh, let me get this right. E, G sharp, C, D sharp. Right, a proper suspense chord. Now, I wonder if I can, am I smart enough to go between those two last chords? Uh, no, <laughs> my hand doesn't want to do it. <laughs> right, so those are the kind of chords that can tell a story all on their own. So if you think about combining a bunch of those, I'm not saying, obviously I'm not saying you play them all on E minor, right? But you play around with some, uh, you start with one of the scary chords and then try moving to a different route and seeing if one of those, you know, an add nine or a minor major seven, something like that sounds good over the next route. And and this is how we move forward constructing stuff. Uh, diminished chords, right? So, uh, meat and potatoes, everyday major and minor keys, they all feature one diminished chord, which we normally will often avoid using. If we're making popular music, you know, if we're making dance floor fillers, if we're making cheesy pop, or even, you know, just straight rock songs, we often avoid using these diminished chords. Um, it's the it's the chord that would root on this seven of the scale because, you know, it's like, sorry, I just noticed a question and it distracted me from what I'm saying. I'll finish this now. I'll come and have a look at that question again. Uh, yeah, because, you know, like a diminished chord doesn't lend itself to that kind of music. So what we would tend to do, let's say if you are playing, if you are writing a tune, and um, and you're looking for the next chord to make it work. And the root needs to be, you feel like the root needs to be like on the seven of the scale. Um, let's say the seven of the scale is, um, let's say it's a C, right? And that means it's gonna be a diminished chord within the confines of music theory. Now that's not going to work in a Kylie song, but what we tend to do is just lose that flattened fifth, just substitute a normal fifth for it, just turn it into a minor chord to make the song work. But of course, in this kind of music that we're trying to make, the diminished chord is of great value because listen to that. Right? That's just a, an uncomfortable sound all in itself. Right, so what is Leela saying? Uh, Leela has a question. So minor chords in a major scale slash key. Well, yes. Um, okay, so, so put simply, right, in every major key, you would have three major chords, three minor chords, and a diminished chord. In a minor key, you'd have three minor chords, three major chords, and a diminished chord. Right? Now, let me show you something. Let me just... Oh, Audible's here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, when, when somebody talks about Teeny Bob, I always think Kylie. 
right? Because Kylie, um, those, you know, singles, uh, I should be so lucky. Um, 86, was it? I think it was 86. Um, that To me, that's like the ultimate teeny bop pop. Okay, right. So let me show you something. Um, now, forgive me, Leela. I think this is the question you're asking, but I don't know how much you know or don't know about music theory, but I'm sure that somebody at least in the chat will benefit from this explanation. And by the way, any of these things that I'm talking about, um, if if you need to know more about music theory or anything else I'm discussing, you can always contact me and I will help you. Um, I mean, I teach this stuff all the time. This is my, um, this is half of my work is teaching this stuff. So let me just get my um, overhead view. Right, so to some of you, this may be a little bit noddy, and my apologies. Right, so let's play a C major key. And yes, you can laugh at my fingering, ooh, uh, madam, right? Right, there's my major key, right? C, all the white notes. C, D, E, F, G, A, B. C to conclude, right. Now, Let's play an A minor scale. Okay, that's A to A, all the white notes. Now, that means that A minor has exactly the same notes in it as C major. How can that be? How can a major key have exactly the same notes in it as a minor key well for every major key three semitones down there is a relative minor key that contains exactly the same notes and exactly the same chords only in a different order you see a lot of the time when people teach music they'll teach a minor scale and tell you that that's a miserable scale and teach you a major scale and tell you that's a happy scale and that's really not the case because an A minor scale has exactly the same notes in it as a C major scale it is the chords that make it sound happy or sad um, and and that's kind of the it's kind of the nuts and bolts of music theory it, it's it's something that when I teach in a lesson and I see that it's clicked and the student gets it, they realize shortly after that that's cut down their music theory learning drastically. And, and understanding comes. Because when you realize that, that um, C major is the same as, as um, A minor, G major is the same as E minor, and that the notes and the chords are all common, Everything's interchangeable between the two keys. Then you realize, so when I play a G major, a G major chord, I can use those licks I learned on the guitar that were in E minor, right? Then the next step is showing how to transpose what you learn in one key to another key, which on the guitar is incredibly easy. On the keyboard, uh, not so much, <laughs> but there again, you know, strings are my thing. Okay, now I'm, the chat's flying up all of a sudden, and I am, and and I'm. I hope I'm not missing anything important. Um, I'm going to have to write a disco banger in the style of Schoenberg, though I expect Zappa has already done it. <laughs> yes. If you're laughing while fingering, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> really? <laughs> cool, I want to know the Hendrix chord, Jamie. Can you help me? The Hendrix chord? Um, yeah, yeah, I can teach you the Hendrix chord. No problem. Okay. I'm ignoring all the stuff about Kylie and Jason and Prisoner Cell Block H. Right, perhaps major minor is the distribution is the distribution and the frequency of the whole step to half step steps 
I mean, there are only 12 semitones in Western music. Yeah, um, it is all about... The, there, there are only 12 notes, right? So how hard can it be, really? The, it's all about those interval steps. He said, playing the keyboard whilst the keyboard's not on screen. Let me proceed with what I'm doing, and I think that some some of this that I'm going to show you is will probably help with what I've just been talking about. Um, okay, so where was I? Right, yeah, so the diminished chord comes into its own in this kind of music. For the Hendrix chord, yes, just play straight upside down. <laughs> Yes. Are we alright, Audible Video? What's going on in your part of the world, dude? Right. So, um, earlier on, I played that, um, that diminished chord with the organ sound, and I moved it up through the inversions, and, um, and I didn't make a terrible job of it. So, seeing as how... Um, Seeing as how I'm talking about a diminished chord now, let me just show you what I did again. Right, so I just play the first inversion of the C diminished. And then move to the second. And then... Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so this time I did do a terrible job of it. We're going to try again. My keyboard play really is laughable. Right now, if I if I program that with MIDI, it would sound incredible. <laughs> right. Okay. So some more things that we can do to make music sound scary. What about a tritone root shift? I'm actually not sure if that's the correct uh, musical terminology for it, but I'll explain what I mean. Um, I just, shall I just I'll use different sound, freshen things up. Um, yeah. Let's use the choir for a moment. Maybe bring that down an octave. Um, okay, so a tritone root shift. What do I mean? And is that even a thing? Well, let's say if we play a diminished chord, and then for the next chord, we root on the flat five interval. What am I on about? Right, so I play um, a C diminished chord. Which sounds challenging and nasty because it has this flat five note in it. So I'm looking for a scary chord shift. I'm looking for a, a chord shift that's going to sound challenging and scary. So what about if when I move, I move to that flat five as my root? That would make it an F sharp minor. Do I even know how to play an F sharp minor? I guess it's that, okay. No, try again. Okay, C diminished. Right? So, <laughs> um, that's a pretty challenging shift. Let's do that again. Then maybe we could move on to an F minor with a flat six. Was that right? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to try that again, because that's got promise. So, uh, C diminished. F sharp minor. That's my tritone root shift. Then we'll go for an F minor flat six. And what about an E minor major seven? Right, that's some pretty scary sounding cordage. And that is exactly the kind of thing that we're looking for. Okay. Um, Audible says, what would be a good name for an electronic track? Any ideas? Okay. Everybody throw your ideas about um, a great a great name for an electronic music track. 
kind of a track though. Uh, oh no, it's Russ is asking. I'm reading it wrong. Okay, so Russ is asking Audible. You're asking Audible? <laughs> Right, okay, now here's another thing. Now, th this one's a bit of a, well, I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you in a moment. So let me just go back to Piano Tech 8, which I'm absolutely loving. And I'm going to say, I think, I think that this is my favorite piano on iOS. I think this is awesome. I always thought that um, Ravenscroft was the best one, but... I'm liking this one more and more recently. Okay, so, what was I on about? Cluster chords, that's it. Okay, now cluster chords are this kind of thing. Right? Now, that might seem silly, right? It might sound like, you know, kids arsing about on your piano. Uh, but you'll hear this a lot in in soundtracks to really old horror movies a cluster chord is just like it's a, a bunch of unrelated notes usually played low on the piano keyboard which you know i personally i find it a little bit difficult to get to grips with with including something like this because of the apparent lack of musicality to them because i'm you know i'm obviously kind of you know stupid snobbish old pompous hippie but um but you can't deny the the effect of them when you hear them in the appropriate position in one of those old tunes okay uh, sudden bursts of volume. So moving on from like note and chord choice, there are some simpler devices now. Um, sudden bursts of volume, all right? So let's uh, think of an example. If I've got some kind of little nice arpeggio thing going on. Uh, I quite like that, actually. All right, yeah, so what am I talking about? Sudden bursts of volume. So if I'm playing this nice, pretty little arpeggio. Right, so, <laughs> beautifully played, Jamie. Um, so if you, if you kind of, if you're keeping it kind of nice and low and quiet and you suddenly... Uh, suddenly hit them with a load of volume it's like the musical equivalent of a jump scare speaks for itself really now uh volume swells this was one that quite a few people mentioned that i hadn't thought about myself let me just grab um where is it there we go studio violas this is actually um logic pro for ipad internal sound which really surprised me just how good it was actually we are and it's not working now what have i done have i oh i turned the volume <laughs> i turned the volume down because i want to show you a volume swell stupid hippie okay play the chord right again speaks for yourself i don't have to tell you why that would work brilliantly well in a horror track now that we've uh but now that we've selected the violas let me just use this sound to show you something else that again quite a few people mentioned this if i go in here i'll use my mouse so you can see what i'm doing up here i can change the articulation of this instrument from sustain to tremolo and let's just hear how much difference changing this over to tremolo makes to the way that this might suit a horror track. All right, now let's add to that. Let's add to that um, the um, thingy. I forgot what. <laughs> Do I even know what I'm doing? Uh, let's add to that the volume swell. Right. Okay, heard that in many a 
many a horror theme tune. Um, glissando, right? So glissando is basically just sliding a note from one note to another, which is easy to do on a guitar than the keyboard. But fortunately, the keyboards tend to come equipped with these little pitch bend things, right? So glissando. Hmm, be good if there were more travel on it than that. Let's try starting it bent down, right? <laughs> we'll start bent down and then bend up. Yeah, not very smooth, Jamie, but you get the idea. Um, another thing that I was surprised how few people mentioned this was, uh, here we go, this one. Drones. This is a sound which I found in um, Logic Pro for iPad. It's a sampler sound. Right? I mean, a perfect beginning to some kind of frightening soundtrack. Um, I don't think there's really anything to say about drones other than that drones are really cool if you want to make scary music. Now, tempo. Tempos, uh, very slow tempos can be kind of like a dark, bring like a, a dark and mysterious vibe to a track. But a gradual increase in tempo could make you feel like something is about to happen. Like you're heading towards something, you know, the monster's getting nearer. That kind of thing, right? So, I don't know, let's just grab uh, my piano again. And um, uh, what was that little arpeggio? I quite like that. Right, okay, so tempo. We're talking about tempo, so. You know, it increases the tension as it gets quicker. Um, uncomplicated and easy to do in Logic Pro for iPad because it has the tempo track. And uh, the last thing on my list for musical devices or, you know, music theory and how we can apply it to, um, to a composition to make something into a, a scary soundtrack is... Time signatures. Now let me think. See, can I can I demonstrate this with a, a piano alone? Let me think. Um, let's just take a very simple thing, uh, and I'm choosing a simple thing so that I might stand a chance of being able to play this. Right. So. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. I know this is like overly simplistic, but um, you know my my piano playing is terrible, so. So, um, this is going to be in 4-4. Four, four. See, any kind of, um, any kind of, any kind of musical notage that uh, is going to be divisible by four, I was explaining that really badly. <laughs> right, okay, what am I trying to say? Most popular music is... Uh, done in time signatures that are divisible by four. In fact, most music is in 4-4. Four, four. And the reason for that is because you can tap your foot to it, you can dance to it, and the vast majority of music that we hear, you know, are for mass consumption. You want to be able to dance to it or bang your head to it. You know, a groove that's easy to get into. More challenging kinds of time signatures don't really lend themselves to mass consumption music. However, weird time signatures do lend themselves very, very well to horror music because they can really make you feel kind of off kilter and uncomfortable. The stranger the time signature, the better. A couple of examples, the beginning of Tubular Bells, that fantastic arpeggio, that's, um, I can't remember, is it, it's something like 15-8 or something something bizarre like that. And Halloween, which is kind of a similar kind of approach, is in 5-4. Uh, 
So let's go back to this and see if I can explain this a bit better. Okay, so I'm going to play something very basic that is in 4 4. So there's eight notes here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Right? Now, let's make it seven, eight. Right? So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Start again. Right? Now, normally, six, eight is one of those time signatures that. Uh, you could be forgiven for thinking that a track that you're listening to that's in 6-8 is in 4-4 four, four, because you can dance to it similarly to how you would dance to a track. That's... A good example is um, Queen's Somebody to Love. Right, I've got the track in my head and I'm tapping it out and I just realised that you can't hear the song that's in my head, right? So it's like, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, and that's the feel of the song. Um, but it's not an uncomfortable tempo. However, what if what if we go what if we go um, seven eight six eight? Uh, hang on, what's that going to be? Right, so that's seven eight. Then six eight would be. Right, okay. Can I do both? Right, okay. I'm going to stop before I screw up because I'm amazed I managed to play that three times through without screwing up, okay? But if you can imagine that with some kind of percussion to it, which would accentuate the fact that it is not in 4 4, that it is an uncomfortable timing, that. That would that would be an ideal thing to play. That's like um, not the notes, but the the timing. Maybe I can apply it to something um, cooler sounding when I actually make my track. That's a thought. What would that make it? That would be seven, eight, and six, eight. That's is that that's thirteen. I think you could call that thirteen, eight. Yes. Is it normal to have a jukebox in your head? Yes, it is. I'm sure it is. Sounds like a mashup of Jaws meets Halloween. <laughs> well, that's the thing. In fact, I would have to say, right, Jaws um, has got to be like the um, the best horror music. I'm going to say this is my favourite horror movie music. You could argue it's not even a horror movie. It's more of a monster movie, really, I suppose. But that device, that root to minor second. It's not just that it makes the music frightening and, the, and it gives that kind of feeling of, of uh, dread. And as it gets quicker and quicker, it makes it more and more intense. It's also a brilliant brilliant device that they used in the film to um um to let you know that the shark's getting nearer and nearer and nearer so it's like a really practical device as well as musical um here's a thought for you slightly um left field thought maybe but um earlier on at the beginning of the stream i was talking about how scary music can make you feel very uncomfortable and what it actually did to me after my gig that night um consider this a scary movie and a scary soundtrack right go together because because they do <laughs> all right thinking on my feet here okay so you've got a you've got a scary movie with a scary soundtrack. Now, if you separate those two things, the scary soundtrack still, for me, stands up on its own. If it's a truly scary soundtrack, that's an entity on its own, which still has value. What about the movie 
without the scary music. Have you ever have you ever bought a Blu-ray? You know that when you buy a Blu-ray of your favourite movie and it's got all those outtakes and extra rubbish on it, which, you know, <laughs> you rarely get around to watching all of it. And it's got deleted scenes on it. Now, very often, deleted scenes have no music on them because, you know, they were cut out of the movie before they got to the point where they added the soundtrack to them. Have you ever watched any of those? Movies without music. Yeah. I watched uh, <laughs> I watched a few from some of the Star Wars prequels. Uh, you know, those movies that were a bit disappointing, really. But, but you know, but I watch everything in Star Wars anyway because I'm an utter, utter gimp. But, um, but, yeah, some of those outtakes, you know, Vader comes on and it's not that scary without the Imperial March, you know. And Padme is not as pretty without the love, uh, the love theme music playing, you know. Okay, I'm going to stop before I get any deeper. Um, so, time signatures. We did that, yes. I can go into that more when I'm working on my track. Okay, I've got to the bottom of my list. So, let me just check in here. I believe I've covered... Right, so I've covered all of the sounds that people suggested that I could possibly do on my iPad. Um, and I've covered not every scary chord or every scary interval or anything, but I think with that I've given you a reasonable idea of what it is that we're looking for um, if we're wanting to make some scary sounding music. Uh, and people have appeared in the chat that I've not said hello to. And actually, I don't think I even said hello to Russ, which is disgraceful because Russ is actually my bandmate. Um, so apologies, Russ. I didn't know that you were here. I just uh, neglected to say hi. And Riff Room. Have I missed anyone else? If I've missed anyone else, if I haven't said hello to you, just throw something in the chat so I can stop being such a, a rude bastard. Okay, now, I'm just going to very quickly have a go at something in Logic Pro. I want to end this stream by 8 o'clock. So I'm just going to have a quick little go at something. Because if you guys didn't, like, thoroughly hate this, then I'm going to continue and I'm streaming about this. I'm going to make a track is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a scary horror soundtrack and I'll live stream it if anyone is in the least bit interested. So let's go to a different view. We need my iPad on here and maybe we need my overhead view as well. Yeah, let's go with that. Okay, now, what I want to show you is, I will use my mouse so we can see what we're doing. Right, now, if I press this button up here, Logic Pro for iPad reveals the tempo track, where I can sort of speed up and slow down the track. But if I press and hold here, I can also make other things appear. So I've got a marker track up here. If I want to like write in little boxes what each section of the song is. Uh, I don't really use that. It's a brilliant idea but I just don't really use it. And I don't really use the key signature thing either. I don't really need that personally. So what I do want for this track though is time signature. Now let me just put my metronome on and let's see what kind of a speed we've got going on here. Right, okay, now I, I played a riff earlier that I kind of liked, so see if I can remember it. Three, four. Can't remember it exactly. <laughs> okay, well, 
It's something like that. But we want an uncomfortable time signature, don't we? So I figure, like, how do you start writing a horror track? Maybe I want to start with a drone. Maybe I want to start with some atmospheric sounds. Maybe, um, and actually there is something in my project that I haven't shown you and I've decided what I'm going to do is save it. Just a moment. Apologies. I'm going to save it and show it you a bit in a bit more depth. Probably in a stream which I will do tomorrow. I think I'll do a stream tomorrow, right? If anyone's up for that, I'll do a stream tomorrow and we'll take a look at it. And that is... Uh, that is Lines. Now, this app, um, I watched a fantastic demo of this by Jade Star on how to app on iOS. And uh, YouTube doesn't need for me to do the whole thing again. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use it when I start working on my track or when I continue working on my track tomorrow. And you'll get to hear it in practical use. So, there's that. I must remember to do that tomorrow. What I want here is I want a bar of 7, 8, and then a bar... Of, oh, wait, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I could do a bar of 13, 8. Can I do that? Let's see if I can do that. Okay, so, basically here, time signatures. Right. We want to change the time signature to, and I've just realized I was talking about something and then I've got sidetracked. Yeah, so, you know, thinking about like, let's change that to 13. Thinking about where to start your horror track. I'm really not sure. I don't know how I want it to begin. I don't know what the content's going to be right now, but I feel that I'd like it to have like a signature riff. You know, like the way that, Halloween does or the way that Tubular Bells does it's got that sort of kind of a kind of a riff there that keeps repeating I want something like that so I'm going to start with that it might not be at the beginning of the track but let's see if we can make that happen so 13 8 oh it's put 13 8 just there All right I've made a change there I don't want that can I delete the 4 4 and just have 13 8 can I not do that? I don't know. If I'm honest. I'll tell you what I'll do. Is I will delete 13.8. Select 4.4. 4, edit that. And. It's really difficult to move that wheel with my mouse. Okay, so now we've got 13.8 for the whole track. Now we're going to find out whether or not my idea of 13.8 is correct. <laughs> That's pretty fast. Mm. Okay, well maybe I can just drop the tempo. I'm not hearing my piano. Why am I not hearing my piano? Okay. I'm going to try that tempo for now. It's probably completely wrong. Right, okay. So I want 13 notes. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Right, I think that's what I want. I want to start recording from some random place. And you just try and get that timing. Right, okay, I think I've I think I'm with it. 
over a delete button in Logic Pro for iPad. Right. Okay, that's very poorly, very poorly played in. But it, I might just get away with it. If I just go in here and is Sam still here? There's a question I want to ask Sam about Logic Pro because it's something I've not managed to find. But Sam is the man. If anyone knows this thing that I'm trying to do, if anyone knows whether it's doable or not in Logic Pro for iPad, he will know. So Sam, are you still with us? Select all. Let's go and quantize that. Um, right. Here's what I want to know. I haven't found a way. There's a way in Cubasis 3 that you can... Um, you can make all the notes the same length. So you see how I've got, right? Hey, Sam's here. All right, Sam. Okay, so here's what I want to know. What I've done, I've quantized all these notes to, you know, the, the I've put them in time, right? What I want to know is, is there a way in Logic Pro for iPad that I can make all these notes the same length? Can I uh, select them all and make them all like a 16th note long? like I can in Cubasis 3. Editing MIDI looks a lot easier in Logic. You can, uh, right, hang on. You can, under notes, you can set the length of notes. Under notes. Uh, do you mean, you must mean in here. Do you mean in here? Uh, oh, right, they're all highlighted in the inspector under notes. So, right. <laughs> Note length? <sighs> That's going to make them all increase by a set. Inspector, scroll down, details, and type length. Ah, right, yeah, but it's it's making them all longer or shorter by the same degree. What I want is to type in a, a length zero, zero, one, zero. Okay, you know what, I trust you, Sam. Let's do what Sam says. Zero, zero, one, zero. I have absolutely no idea, Sam, how you retain all this information. Ah, right, that's actually made them all half the length that I wanted, but um, we're, we're in 13 eight, so it is a bit confusing. So if I just grab one of them now, I can make them all, all look at that. You see? Right, I'm with you, Sam. Thanks, man. Sam, he's the man who knows. He's like, he's the walking manual. He is the dude. It should be you, Sam, who has a YouTube channel. You know, you just know the things. Okay, right, so that's 13.8, and um, the arpeggio might not be exactly the notes I'm going to use, but it's, but it's something to have for now. I'm going to set up a loop around there. Let's have a listen to the speed of it. Take off a metronome. I can just imagine that speeding up, maybe start it a bit slow. Yeah, maybe start it a bit slow and gradually bring it up. That's one option. That's something we could do. Um, now, let's see. That's in C. Let's put a drone on there. Which isn't working. <laughs> Why is it not working?
That doesn't sound like that's pitched to C to me. Right, that sounds more like it's pitched to uh, to um, an A sharp, that drone. It shouldn't be, but anyway, no worries, you know, we can worry about that later. All right, so I've got kind of like a, that might be a signature lick. I might have a play around with the notes in there. Perhaps I might speed it up. And um, we're probably going to need some, I'm excited about this now, and I really need to finish this stream in a few minutes. So I'm just going to try something really quickly, all right? So, um... Uh, yes, let's go with the beat hook choir. I'm going to pitch that down an octave. Okay, now, here's the thing, is right. When you come up with a little melody, and uh, particularly if you come up with the melody first, and you've got challenging notes, and you've got some outside notes, then that's going to affect what chords you can put to it. And that can be something that's a little complicated to work out. But the thing is, is we're making horror music. We're making something that's supposed to sound challenging. It's not supposed to sound pretty. So, just let your ears be your guide, right? You just play some... I'm just going to play some chords to this and see if they sound like abysmal... Or, you know, not altogether thoroughly terrible. And we'll go from there. So let's see, that's a C. It's based around like a C minor C diminished. It moves between both. So let's just try a few chords, see what happens. Try putting some uh, low notes in, like a like a choir root note. It's a long way from being awesome, but I think that that's kind of got a bit of potential. So um, I'm going to do another stream tomorrow. I want to continue working on this. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you very, very much for being here. I wasn't really sure what would happen um, because, you know, like people do live streams where they show you apps and people do live streams where they perform songs and People do live streams where they talk bollocks for hours, and for some reason, people seem to watch them. Um, but, um, and, and you know, and I, I've, I've done a combination of all of those things. But um, I thought, what about if I did a stream where I talk about, like, the theory and the science of it, and, and maybe to one or two people that might be helpful. And I wasn't sure. I thought maybe some people would kind of... Um, could kind of click on the video and um and think yeah actually that's really boring you stupid hippie so um so th thanks for being here and i hope it genuinely was um useful um oh there's, no, there's something i've got to check before i go um when the cubase 3 eventually uh, update eventually drops i'll take a look at it but i doubt it will pull me back from logic pro for ipad um, yeah, the, the thing I wanted to check was I wanted to check that um, Samuel had was there and had heard my news about Cubasis 3 earlier on, which I'm going to share a little bit more widely. I'll probably do that later on. But um, yes, um, it's a bit of a negative attitude, Sam. 
you don't you don't know you don't know what they're working on you have no idea what they're working on. and i have honestly no idea what they're working on maybe what they're going to do is they're going to add to cubase's 3 they're going to add a great drum editor and maybe they're going to add a tempo track please and maybe once and for all they're finally going to add mono mix down they're going to make it so that i can freeze my guitar my bass guitar my kick drum to a mono file not one of those dreadful dual dual mono file things that i don't want to send to any producer you know um those those are my three things and um and you know there, there's there's other things but those are my three things i know you're a logic guy sam i know you are um i know you are and uh and i get that i totally get that because like for me you know i, I used cubase like right from the start because like i'm very very old and when i was taught to use how, how to use a proper recording studio which is like one of the the best opportunities that i have ever ever had um this this producer this guy who owned this studio taught me how to use it and um and i worked there and and i you know it was amazing it was a brilliant brilliant time you know but um they had cubase like version one and i learned all about how to simply it up to the tape machine and all that stuff so for me like although i've used everything else and there's loads there's tons of fantastic great doors out there i'm so comfortable with cubase because it's the first thing i use so you know um yeah anyway so went on a little rant about cubase and cubase is there right so i um uh, i'm gonna bugger off now Thank you ever so much for being here. Thank you for joining me. Thank you to you wonderful folks who have uh, super chatted. Every little bit helps right now. Thanks ever so much. Um, I hope that wherever you are in the world, um, you're not um, you're not going to get flooded out because we've certainly been uh, uh, keeping an eye on the the floods in the local area and uh, being very very concerned so have a fantastic rest of your day and look out for me advertising my stream for tomorrow and hopefully you'll join me then all right so until then have a wonderful evening make some music and try not to piss pants about see you later bye bye